have it. And uh, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. And so, that's right. And so, I just want to call that forward. And if you uh, would like to talk about that, please see me before it's too late. <laughs> Love you all. All right, why don't we bring the lights up? I want to talk to you real quick about some things before we jump into God's Word tonight. Um, I mentioned uh, a little bit ago that we took a motorcycle ride just the other day. Uh, last night we, um, we went up to Ocala and we went and saw and went and, and enjoyed a, a, a worship service at a church of God up in Ocala. There's several different churches of God, which is kind of strange, right? Because there's only one God. So, you know, I feel about that denomination stuff, but there is uh, several churches of God. We went up there and we had a, a great time. And um, when I was up there, I have to tell you that it was, um, it was beautiful, but it was very different than what we experience here. And, and I don't know if you're good with that or not, but I, I, I am becoming more and more good with that every day. And, and I just, I want to I share something with you. That, you know, Karen talked about um, the vertical church thing that we do on Wednesday, and it's super, super important that you come to it. Now, there's a lot of things that are demanding your time and saying that they're important, and I'm going to add this one to the list, and you ask the Lord what, you know, you should do with your schedule, but... The vertical church study is, is, is our attempt to try to get us all on page with what God wants for his church. You know, there's a lot of churches out there, and we do a lot of different things. We're all very diverse, but God has a purpose for his church. He established the church, the body of Christ, and he wants it to do something, and he wants to accomplish something through it, and that's what this study is all about. But there's a sentence in here in the book that we read this past Wednesday, and it's just been ringing and ringing loudly in my head, and it won't stop. And last night reinforced this greatly. This is what it says. Pastor James, this is not the word of God. This is just his insight. He said, the church isn't made of bricks or concrete or plaster. The church is made of people. Now, we all know that, right? We all know that. But this is what he says after. This is the thing that really struck home. He said, it's the entire community of people who have been redeemed by God, all knitted together by the Holy Spirit on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Listen. <clears throat> I celebrate who we are. I celebrate this room right now. Because I know most of you pretty well, and I know that a lot of us come from different backgrounds. Man, I'm Jewish. There's some people that come from a Catholic background. Some people come from Episcopalian. Some people come from Presbyterian. Some people come from Baptist. Some people come from Southern Baptist. Some people were atheists. Some people are super charismatic. Some people are super calm. And that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. And so I just, I just hope that you'll celebrate that with me. I think that it's beautiful. And I think that if we could just think about that, the body of Christ is the entire community that has been redeemed by God. Do you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and church folks, I, I was I talking to Carl today, we, we fight more to, against each other than we fight darkness. And, and we all think that we have it all figured out, including myself sometimes. I think I have the word of God figured out. I got it all figured out, man. Come to my church. I know the answers. Listen, before there was, there was nothing. We can't even understand that. You can't even understand what nothing is, right? It's beyond your brain. But, and then into the nothing, there was already something. And that something that was in nothing spoke something into the nothing and there was something. Come on. And we argue over who should speak in tongues and when and charismatic and reformed. And I mean, listen, it's the entire community of those who have been redeemed by God through Christ. Right. So it, do, right? So it doesn't make any difference. We should celebrate the diversity and that is what we're going for at Revolution. 
We don't need clones of Moses. We don't need clones of Jessica. We don't need clones of Purple. We don't need clones of Cindy. We don't need clones of Michael. What we need is more Jesus and the diversity of the body of Christ. And I celebrate that here in our church. And it's not always been that way. But it seems here in the last couple of weeks or so, I think the Holy Spirit's actually taking over, not in some big visual show thing, but he's binding us in our diversity together in unity. And that's beautiful. I hope that you rejoice in that with me. Okay? Please, yeah. You can clap. Someone was about to clap. Yeah, it's good. It's good. All right, listen. Let's grab our Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 6, okay? Matthew chapter 6, that's where we'll be. And uh, while you're turning there, I want to ask you guys a question. I know that there's a lot of places you could go to get information. That's what we're here for, right? We're here to, to celebrate God. We're here to learn there's a lot of learning opportunities in this world and ways to, to, to flourish and have a better life, right? We all have tons of phones and computers and all these gurus and all that stuff. Listen, how about this guy? You guys know who this guy is? Show him. Put him up on the screen. You know who that is? Anyone know who that is? Tony Robbins, right? Tony Robbins, super, super popular guy, right? If you've never heard of him, I don't know what rock you've been living under, but he's super famous. He's, he's, he's got multiple best-selling books, and he's an incredible motivator, <clears throat> and he's a brilliant businessman, and he calls out uh, things and people so they can have a life that's flourishing. And, you know, if you want to get some advice from him, and it won't be bad advice by any means, but if you'd like to get some advice from him, um, he will be in L.A., on March 14th through the 17th, listen, general admission, right? General admission, just a regular ticket, $795. He's a really smart guy. That's how you become a motivational guru. <laughs> Do as I do. He's got an amazing resume, honestly. M multiple best-selling. One of uh, Forbes magazine calls him one of the most influential business gurus in all of the world. And he's, um, he's had millions of people served in his business and his big arena motivation speeches and walking on hot coals and screaming and yelling. And, you know, he's, listen, I'm not ragging. Like, he's good. He's good. He's good. But listen, I got, a, I got a, another guy. He's got a different resume. Let me read you his resume. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ. Tony, can you do that? And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This guy, Tony Robbins, is awesome. And you can pay $795 to get some advice from a very wise man. Or, listen to this, astounding invitation to sit at the feet of the one who created Tony Robbins and learn how to flourish in life for free. No $795. Awesome. And that's exactly what the Sermon on the Mount is. He, he calls up his disciples and says, come on up here, and I'm going to tell you how to flourish in life. And that's where we are. And so I want to call to your attention something here tonight. In Matthew chapter 6, you're going to see something. He's, he says, uh, depending on your translation, in the NIV, he'll start off by saying, be careful. Warning, warning, warning. ESV, beware, King James. Take heed in our New Living Translation. Watch out! There's a warning here from the one who created all things 
And then all things are sustained by the power of his word. And he says, watch out. Tonight I want to preach a message called Bottom Shelf Blessings. Bottom Shelf Blessings. You know what I'm talking about too. You know when, when, you know when you're a kid, when you go to the little department store or whatever, we used to go to the store called King's up in Massachusetts. We used to go to the store King's. And down in the bottom was the, was the cheap stuff and the bargain basement stuff, the little dollar things, right? And that's where the kids were. And they put them down there on purpose because the kids will see them and grab them. And look, it's only a dollar. And so if you hound your parents enough, you can get the little chintzy Cracker Jack prize and spend a dollar for it. But there, listen, you guys know that above that stuff, right here at eye level, that was the good stuff. That's where mom and dad can see. They don't see down here. The kids go for that stuff because they think that's all that they can get. But up here is the good stuff, and a lot of us settle for that right down there in life. And Jesus is preaching against us here on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, we were, we've been teaching through this whole sermon here for, I don't know, a month or two. And we just, we see that just keeping the law like these people were doing, it just robs you of the full benefit available to you that's wrapped up in the actual essence of the law, right? It's, it's, we're, we're settling when we just keep the law, just out of raw obedience, we're settling and we're not getting all that we could out of our obedience because we miss the essence of the law, which was wrapped up in the golden rule in Matthew 7, where it said that all of the law is based on this. Do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you. It's for human flourishing, this Sermon on the Mount. That's exactly what this is all about. It's not about just raw obedience to the law. It's not about this outside behavior modification. I'll just keep the law but miss the essence. Jesus is approaching this with that in mind. He wants to take the people up who are keeping the law but missing the point. And he always wants to work on the inside of us. See, God doesn't just want to change your behavior. He wants to change the inside. Every time Jesus wants to fix your outside, he never grabs a paintbrush. He grabs tools, and he starts operating on the inside of you, and that changes the outside. You know, the Bible talks in Romans, Paul's talking about this circumcision. I know you guys don't want to talk about circumcision. You guys want to talk about circumcision tonight? Uh, the girls are going, sure. Yeah, and the guy's like, no, right? Well, here's, here's the deal with circumcision. Paul says, listen, this circumcision, this outward thing that, you know, that the men would have done to display who they were, like that's meaningless. What, what God really wants is he wants to do a circumcision that actually impacts who you are. And so he wants to circumcise your heart. He wants to change the inside. The outer appearance doesn't really mean anything if it's not coming from a changed inside. Does that make sense? And so that's what we're looking for. We tend to settle on just keeping the law and getting that benefit out of it instead of going after the, the big thing, the better thing. We, we just simply go after the easy win down here instead of digging in and seeking fervently after the greatest blessings that God has available to us, right? Let me give you some examples, just so you know what I'm talking about. How many in the room have ever purchased a new car, absolutely wanted it, and then shortly after that regretted your car payment? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? You regret the car. Listen, why, why? Because in the moment, I want that car. I like that car. I need that car. And then, listen... That payment, and I'm an expert here, man, I'm telling you, that payment that you just got, the first month doesn't, it's no big deal, $400 for this awesome, beautiful car. The problem is, is that awesome, beautiful car, after three years, it has 75,000 miles on it. The kids have stained all the carpets, the leather's ripped, the windows don't go up and down, and you still pay $400. And all of a sudden, you're like, what am I, what am I, stupid? 
So you know what you do? Trade it in for another one, right? Because they want to get that new. And it, listen, and, it, and you run into a car salesman. Don't run into Ken. Hey, man, you can trade this car in. And, and you can just get this brand new one. It only goes up like 30 bucks a month. What's 30 bucks? Yeah, it's only 30 bucks. No, it's 430. But it's only 30 bucks. And so you do it again. Because we're stupid, right? So that's what we do, right? And so we, we do it again and again and again. And all, listen, you know what? That's not the best thing. You know what the best thing is? I was driving with my buddy Greg the other day. Came down here from Dallas. He was visiting me. And, and, I, and I, I took him in my little Subaru down the road, you know. And he was going to pick up his daughter's brand new Chevrolet that he was getting serviced at Ganaway. And she's paying some crazy payment, right? She's like 19 years old making this crazy payment. He's like, man, I don't know what's wrong with that girl. Like, what's wrong with this car? I got a nice little car. It runs, right? It's running. No payments. I don't regret that at all. I love that kind of, that's my favorite kind of car. No payments, right? So, so, so I'm talking about delaying the instant gratification for something greater. Seek something better. Don't settle. How many people, how many people have said yes to a new, listen, not right now, right, but in your life, how many people have, in, in a desire to have companionship, said yes to a boyfriend or a girlfriend that wasn't your first choice, your second choice, not even like your tenth choice, but you wanted companionship, so you said yes and started dating them, and then you absolutely regret it because the thing that you knew was going to happen did, and it ended bad, and you're like, why did I do that, right? Come on, anybody in here? Any, I'm the only one who's... He has bad taste, right? <laughs> you can hit him. Yes. <clears throat> How many people have given away something sacred of their own to one or many instead of waiting for the one? You all know what I'm talking about, right? We settle. We settle. Dead, dead, dead old guys say smart things. C.S. Lewis, put that up on the screen, please. C.S. Lewis said this about us settling. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who, puts, who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. That's us. And we settle for bottom shelf blessings all the time instead of pressing in and going for more. Last week we talked about the, uh, the tax collector. By the way, let me just stop there for a second. If you ever wondered what it looks like for a pastor to get up and have Nasacourt, Allegra, and Benadryl and then chase it down with a monster, a nos, just to try to stay awake, you're looking at it. So here you are tonight, okay? I'm, my eyeballs feel like someone op like poured salt into my eyes. Like, that's what it feels like. So bear with me. So if I, like, just fall over and fall asleep while I'm up here, you'll know why. No worries. I just fell asleep from Benadryl. Um... So last week we talked about um, doing what tax collectors do. You know, they just like, they like who likes them. They're kind to the people that are friendly to them. They're kind to their compadres. They're kind to their associates. But they're not kind to everybody. And God says, you know, what, what reward is that if you're going to act like them? They, they, they're like the worst people. And they're even nice to people who are nice to them. And God's like, that is, there's no reward in that. I want you to go for something greater. What I want you to do is that I want you to be kind as children of God. I want you to be kind to everybody. Even if they're nice, even if they're rotten, even if they've been mean to you, I want you to be nice. I want you to give to them. I want you to help them. I want you to pray for them, right? Watch out. Don't just settle being like everybody else. Don't conform to the image of this world. You're called to something bigger and better and different as God's children. He said in that way, if you're kind to everyone, just like he is, he brings rain to the just and the unjust alike. 
Would you bring your refreshing rain, your kind word, your prayer, your help, your giving to those that are just and unjust? Because when you do, that's when you're really acting as a child of the Father, not just wearing the T-shirt. We talked last week. Um, I was picking on Gunhammer. He tends to have a... Well, you guys know who Gunhammer is, don't you? You guys know who Gunhammer is? Yeah, Gunhammer's Nick. He usually sits right back there where Philip is. He's got a heavy foot, man. He's got a heavy foot on that car. And I've been on him for a long time. He just likes to go fast, man. He likes to go fast. He gets tickets. Stupid, man. It's a lot of money, man. A lot of money. And uh, we talked last night. You know, I went right down into his face when I was talking about it. I didn't want to, like, say his name. I wait for his, him to be not here so I can pick on him. That's what we do, right? I love him. He's one of my favorite people in all the world. If I didn't do it to his face, I wouldn't do it here. But we talked about instead of, you know, not speeding so you can avoid getting in trouble, not speeding just to avoid the ticket, like that's, that's bottom shelf blessing. I just didn't get a ticket. But what's greater is that when you love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and because you love him and he says, keep the law of the land, you want to, if you love me, keep my commands, right? So you, so you don't speak because you love him, plus you're supposed to love others as yourself. So if, you, if I love you and you and you and I, I don't want to endanger you and you've got your kids in the car and she's going to have a baby in the car, right? I don't want to endanger the beautiful baby, so I'm not going to drive like a moron. I'm going to drive with some compassion. That's greater. That's top shelf blessing, right? And that's what Jesus is looking for here in the Sermon on the Mount. We need to seek the better things, not the basic things. And this is not me segueing into some prosperity gospel saying, saying we should seek the fancy things and the, and the, and the beautiful things and the, and the elaborate things. And no, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about uh, Deuteronomy 11:26. Look, today God says... I'm giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. Just choose. Choose what you want. Don't go for the lame thing. Go for the great thing. Don't go for the basic thing. Go for the better thing. Choose the better things. Don't settle. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I came that you might have life in abundance. Right? But listen to the word in there. Don't just breathe through it. That you might doesn't mean everybody does you have to choose it he came with with listen his his death burial and resurrection has with it power for you and provision and it's up to you if you want it if you don't take it it's not gone you just don't benefit from it he wants for you to have an abundant life but you have to choose to have this abundant life you have to choose everything that God would have for you. This power in choice. Now listen, this message from the Sermon on the Mount, it's, from, it's for every person. There's certainly diversity in the world. We talked about that a moment ago. We celebrate diversity in the church. But there's certainly diversity in the world, right? Everybody looks different. Everybody's from different places, different ethnicities, different age, different taste, different sin, different perspective. Everybody's different for sure. But in some ways, we're all the same. And one of the ways that we're all very similar is that we all tend to settle. No matter who you are, we tend to settle. This is what I'm talking about. God's Word would tell us in 1 John 2, 16. You can look if you want to. It will tell us the way that we settle. The things that we go after that the world would offer. We go after physical pleasure. Oh, that would feel good. I'd like to have sex with him. I'd like to have sex with her. I have sex with anybody. I could eat this food. It's going to feel good. I, I, want, to, I want to eat that thing. I don't care if I jack somebody's marriage up. I don't care if I social disease. And I don't care about the baby that might come. I don't care about the ramifications. I don't care who it would hurt. I want to feel good about myself. And I don't care about the drug. I mean, listen, I'm only hurting myself. And, and, and I, it would feel good to get a good buzz on and accept in, until you get behind the wheel with your drugs and your drinking and you hurt somebody. 
But I don't, the lust of the flesh doesn't care about that. It only wants to please itself, and a lot of us, if not all of us, are guilty of this. The lust of the eyes, he would go on to say. That would include, including sexual things. I, oh, he looks good, she looks good, that looks good. I need that car, I need the new phone, I need that shirt, I want a bigger house, I want this, I want that. So much so that I go into massive debt, and no longer am I a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I'm a prisoner of Visa. And my life is run. Listen, so, hey, so long tithes, so long offering, i got to make my minimum payment. That's what happens. And we live in that regret, in that self-made prison. And then the pride and achievements and possessions. Oh, I wanted that girl. I wanted that man. I wanted that food. I wanted that drug. I wanted that booze. I wanted that thing. I want that stuff. And look at what I got, everybody. Just put another feather in my cap. I got another girl. I got another guy. Look at my big house. Look at my beautiful car. Look at all the things that I have. Listen, I got, I got 8,000 people in my church. My company's rocking. My wife is hot. My kids are perfect. They're all going to Ivy League schools. Look at me. I want to... Look, I'm a people pleaser. I need your praise. That's what I need. The pride of my achievements and my possessions. These are the ways that we all settle. And Jesus says, watch out. Be careful of this, Christian. Be careful of this. Watch out for settling. Watch out for entry level. Watch out for basic junior varsity minor league bottom shelf blessings. That's what chapter 6 is all about. That's what he's talking about here. As a matter of fact, the entire Sermon on the Mount, 48 verses coming out of the creator of heaven and earth speaking to you today. I heard a profound statement. Listen up. This is awesome. It's not mine. I'm stealing it from last night. This guy, this old country preacher, he kept saying, hey, man, I'm so dumb. I'm so dumb. Like, I, you know, all these little, these little hick phrases. I, I was rolling in the aisles. Guy was hysterical. But he said this thing right at the beginning of the message. He wasn't like some deep preacher. He wasn't going, you know, really. But he was just this awesome man. He just loved God and loved people. You just see it, man. He was just so friendly and happy. And he said, listen, I'm getting away from Jesus said. And I'm like, what? He goes, no. Let's change it to Jesus says. Oh, yeah, that was good, right? I was like, that's good. That's good. Like, he's not dead. The word's alive, and when, he, when you read it, he's saying it right now. It isn't, it's not something he said 2,000 years ago. You open up the Bible, he's saying it right now. 48 verses from the Creator speaking to you right now on human flourishing, great relationships, how to love each other, how to honor God, how to pray for each other, be kind to one another. That's what it's all about. And he gives us warning right here on some pitfalls that are common. You ready? Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read an extended section of Scripture, 1 through 18. You guys ready? Okay. Jesus says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give, does it say if? Does your, who's, does your, King James say if you give? What does it say? Oh, okay, I'm just checking. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets. Call attention to their acts of charity. Look at me, look at me, I'm so awesome. You're so awesome. Yay. I tell you the truth. Like, you can count on that, right? When Jesus says, I'll tell you the truth. It's not like me saying it, right? Jesus, one who said light, and it was. He says, to tell you the truth, I lost my place. Oh, yeah, to tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, does the King James say if? It says when to. Hmm. When thou pray, it's for you, Jonathan. 
Don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. Aren't you awesome with your flowing robe and your eloquent... Don't... I tell you the truth, that is all the reward you will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. War room. Someone say war room. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Now I'm going to read it out of here, but you all know. Everyone knows the King James Version. You know, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive others. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Power, glory, amen. Right? So you know that. You know what I'm saying? Get to the point. Anything fancy in there? Any babble? Any, any extra going on in there? What is he saying? Get to the point, man. God doesn't, he's not, he's not um, more prone to move when you get all fancy prayered on him. Like we, don't you have people that you go, man, I just listened to him pray all day. Do you ever feel that? Ever, ever, anyone ever? Yeah, who cares? God's not impressed. Maybe we should stop being so impressed and just get to the point, right? If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse, if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Boom. And when you fast, say if. When you fast, um, just to let you in on a little secret, Leadership of your church, we make it a habit of fasting on Mondays. Not all the time, not 100%, but we make a habit of trying to fast on Mondays before our prayer time. And if you'd like to join us in that and kill the flesh and heighten your spiritual do, 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 and hear from God better, you could join us in fasting. That way you can live into the when you fast instead of the if that's not there. Don't make it obvious when you fast, as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people would admire them for their fasting. I'm fasting. Untucked, wrinkled, hair messed up, unshaved. I'm fasting. I'm fa I am fasting. I am fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair. That's difficult for some of us right there. God asks a lot. It's very difficult to follow the Lord sometimes. And wash your face. You don't need to laugh at me. They're laughing at you, Robert, not me. Um, so then no, one will, then no one will notice that you're fasting, except your Father, who knows what you do in private. And your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. So he says, watch out! In these four areas of life, these are good things, right? Good deeds, giving, praying, fasting. Would you all agree that these are all good, beneficial things for horizontal relationships? You know, you help people, you give to them when they're in need, you pray for them, and sometimes you really want to pray because some things can't get broken in someone's life and fixed without fasting and praying. So we fat like, are those things good for the horizontal relationships? Would you all agree? Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I agree. However, for, for true 100% maximization of human flourishing, it has to include a vertical element. We're talking about God's rewards here, right? And I don't know what they are. It doesn't list them, but he says there's reward. for. So if you're just doing something for someone else, like you're helping them, that's true. But you're part of that equation too. And if you only help them, and that's it, that's not true human flourishing. That's flourishing for the person you're helping. But what about you? God says, I want you to be a part of that too. I want to reward you. You're rewarding them. I want to reward you also so that everybody is blessed. He wants to maximize our human flourishing. Don't settle for bottom shelf blessing. Go for more. And when you... Do for someone just to benefit them, and that's it. And it ends on, hey, thank you for doing that, and you accept that praise. That's the end of it. 
But if you will do something for someone, if you will help them, if you will give, if you will pray, if you will fast, and doing it desiring no return or praise, then they and you are being blessed. You see? You see it there. Because now you've engaged God on your own benefit. He says, I will reward you, not because you're awesome, but because I am. I'm awesome. And it is my will. Listen, do you ever wonder about God's will for your life? Here it is right here. It is his will to reward you. And you can see it there in the text. I'm not making anything up. Look, look back in chapter 6, right, right at the beginning. He says, um, if, you, if you're doing a good deed publicly to be admired by others, then you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. So he's saying, listen, there's a reward that he wanted to give you, and you just waived it. He's clear that he wants, his will is to reward. And just in case, because it's not worded perfectly there, look at verse 4. If you give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything, what does it say? He will reward you. He, he will reward. Look, go again here in verse, um, verse 8. But when you pray, now we're talking. So first it was about good deeds. Then, then what? Then giving. Here's prayer. If you pray in private, if you go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, war room, and pray to your father in private, then your father who sees everything, what's it say? Will reward you. And, and again, here down at the bottom of the, at the end of fasting, he says in verse 18, then no one will notice that you're fasting, so don't go public with it. Keep it on the down low. But if you do, your father who knows what you do in private, and your father who sees everything, what's he say? He will reward you. God's will is to reward his people. His inclination, his nature is to want to reward you. And we waive that. Going for those bottom shelf blessings of just someone's praise and attaboy. So let's get down into the dirt of this. Let's get out of that text and let's just talk about life here. Some examples of what we're talking about. So let's just talk about giving for a second. I don't know about you, and I think somehow because I have a title, that somehow like people think I have some like in with the Father, you know? Like, so they, I can't, all, all the time people are coming up to me saying, and they're telling me what they give and who they give it to and how much they gave. Like, and I'm like, stop. Don't blow your blessing. Just shut up. Don't say anything. They come up to you, and it's all the time. It's, it's, um, I'm not trying to brag, but I'm not looking to be praised, but. And, I, and listen, I wouldn't tell anybody else, but I'll tell you. I'm like, no, watch out. You're about to settle. Just Stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. You see, my, my praise is lame. Nobody needs my praise. It's totally lame. As a matter of fact, I am so, I've been doing this now for how long? Almost 15 years, right? For a while? And, and listen, I don't know about you guys. Like some people in the room might be a lot more holy than me and praise God for you, but I'm just me. And if I can be honest and transparent and that helps somebody... Awesome. If, if you're looking to me as your standard and I fail you because I admit my flaw, you're in the wrong church. I'm going to help you. I want to, listen, for me, I want a pastor who's down in the ditch with me, right? I, wanna, I want someone who's in the dirt with me, fighting the same battles and seems to have maybe found a, a pathway out, but he's in the battle with me. And so let me just admit to you that having done this for a long time, I've seen, I, I, I've seen some great giving. I've also seen some real crappy giving. And i just be honest with you, you have to give something really special, like big, to impress me. I'm a human, right? It has to be something. If you, if you say I bought a, listen, is there anything wrong with buying a, a homeless dude a, a happy meal, a, a value meal? Nothing wrong with it, right? But it's not going to impress me. I mean, that's great, awesome, but it doesn't impress me. 
You got to do something, something substantial to impress me because I've been looking at it and seeing it for a long time and I'm human. I'm not quite there yet. But isn't it interesting how God is so different here? See, when you read this text, he's not, he's not like our standards. He's not like us. He isn't even interested, he's not even interested in the how good the deed was. Or how, he never says how much you have to give. He doesn't tell you what you need to pray about, really, or the style or the language that you're supposed to exactly use. That's all he's concerned about is motivation. That's all he's concerned about is the motivation behind these actions. The reward isn't based on the quality or the quantity of action, just the motivation. And he says, listen, if you give or help someone or do anything for someone else and you do it, and then you're doing it to receive the praise of people, that praise that you got, it ends there. Bottom shelf. And he's like, I have so much more for you if you will change your motivation and shut your mouth and just give as my conduit, you'll see I'll bless you as well. Now, how many people in the room believe that we're supposed to keep our giving to ourselves? Raise your hand. You believe that, right? You're not supposed to talk about it, right? We see it in the text, right? Do you see it? You saw it. We're not supposed to talk about it. So from now on, let's not talk about it. I don't want to hear, well, you know, I just want to tell you, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. Please, don't tell me. Don't tell anybody. Keep it between you and God. Whatever you put in the baskets, you and God. Whatever you give to someone, you and God. And that's it. So we all, we read this section of scripture and we all believe 100% that what it says we should do, right? But here in this next section, this is where it really gets a little tricky for me. And I only want to see the kingdom of God advance here tonight. And so this is a little bit, this is really tough right here. Tough to, to really tell you what I'm going to tell you and tough to read this. Because sometimes as Christians, we do things because we do things. We don't do things because the word of God says something. We just do it because that's what we do. And I want to, I want to, I want for our church, for you guys, I want everything that we would do for the Lord to be from the Lord. Does that make sense? I want it to be from here. No, don't, let's just not pick up a bunch of things that we do just because that's what we do. Let's do it because it actually says to do it. Or let's not do it because it says not to. So you guys, you, you saw the part about the giving. And it says, don't let your left hand know what the right. Like, keep it between you and the Lord and that's it, right? But he says the same thing about prayer. And this is kind of tough for me because I'm a pastor. And so I want to like, I, I generally will get up and I start praying you know, with you all, publicly and stuff. But I'm reading the words of Jesus, and I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm not saying you can't pray publicly. I'm not saying I can't get up and pray with you. But he's like, watch out. you got to check your motives when you do it. He's not saying that you can't do it necessarily. Check your motives, man. Check your motives, because I think... Every pastor in the world, if they were really, really honest with you, would tell you that they like being up here. It feels good. Everyone in this room is looking at me right now. It's a little scary, but it feels good because I feel like I've accomplished something. I mean, that's just being honest and transparent. So we got to be careful about the motive behind what we're doing. And he says, be private about your giving. He also says, be private about your prayer. She's doing a little research. At the beginning of Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, and 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes down for everybody to see what he's praying for them. So I'm like, well, that's strange. Because Jesus says kind of, you know, go in private when you pray. Don't be out in public and fancy prayers for everybody to hear and see. But Paul himself is... I just started thinking about that. Well, yeah, he's telling them what he's praying for. But Paul's always teaching, you know that? Paul was always teaching. Every moment is a teaching opportunity in his life. So he was teaching them about what God's heart was for them. 
He's telling them, this is what I'm praying for you because this is what God wants for you. So he's letting them know what he's praying for. But there's only one place that I found, and I may, there may be others, and you can find them, and if so, I'd love to hear from you. There's only one place in the New Testament that I know of where the people actually, it's in Acts chapter 4, verse 24, where they actually got together. This is after there was some persecution and some jail. They got released, and they went back to all the believers, and it says that all the believers lifted their voice together in prayer. And there was actually a prayer written down, and they, they were all saying, so someone was, well, they weren't all saying it at the same time because it wasn't written down. It's just Peter was praying it. They were all praying it with him. So he was actually praying in public, but it's a very isolated situation. This is kind of strange because isn't that what we do in church all the time? I'm not saying that we can't, but can I just challenge you this way? Jesus said, when you pray, do it in private. And then that's what you guys saw that, right? I'm not telling you we can't do it publicly anymore, but I'm just saying something. He's not just saying it to sound good. He said, do your giving in private, and you all said, yeah, we need to do that. But he also said, do your praying in private, but we'll all say, no, we can't do that. It's kind of weird, right? Same sermon, same guy, same audience. And we, well, we got to do that for the giving, but we don't have to do that for the prayer. Confusing for me too, man. So I was thinking about today's on the ground thing, right? This is in the dirt. This is dirty, right? Let's think about the way we pray now. Facebook. Go on Facebook, and I, I do it too. I put a prayer request up. You know, someone says pray for this, and I post it up there, and then all of a sudden, bum, 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 praying. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying right now. I'll pray for you. Here's my prayer, and I'm asking the Father to do this and this and this and this. Listen, awesome. But, be, but watch out. That's all I'm saying. Watch out. Watch out for why you're doing that. That's all he's saying here, right? He didn't say you can't pray. We're supposed to pray, right? He's just saying watch out. Because you might just be putting stuff up there to feel the praise of people. And I have to be honest with you. Again, here I am being very transparent. And maybe I ruin my position with you because I'm not the man you want me to be. But I'm just going to be honest because I think that if I'm honest, it will help others be set free. Sometimes when there's stuff on Facebook and everyone's praying, and, right, and they're just, oh, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. I feel pressured to click prayer because I'm afraid you won't think I'm spiritual if I don't. When all the while I just want to put my phone down and pray. People don't need necessarily to see that you're praying. What they need is your prayers so that you will engage the God who can actually do something in that situation. They, listen, they don't need necessarily. It's nice. Isn't it nice to know someone's praying for you? Absolutely. Isn't it nice to know that they love you enough to give and to help and to do a good deed and pray for you and fast for you? But what do they need more than that? They need God, who you're praying to, to actually enter into that situation and bring light into darkness. That's what they need. And sometimes we waive that because we went for the bottom shelf blessing. That's a problem. And Jesus is saying, watch out for this. Watch out for this. Let's talk about rewards for a second, right? Why is it super, super important to just heed God's word? He says there's rewards for you. If you'll do it his way, he'll do things for you, right? What are the rewards? Does Jesus list them there? Where are these rewards he's talking about? He says if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, there'll be a reward. Where's the reward, Jesus? Does he list them? No, he does not. So do we know what they are? No. So if he says that there are rewards, but we don't know specifically what they are, then we must be entering into this space called faith. The space called faith. Look at, if you will, look at Hebrews chapter 11. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Known as the Faith Hall of Fame. But look at it says here. Faith, right there at the beginning. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we can't see, right? It's like, we don't, I don't even know what it is, but I just believe that it is. 
That's faith. I, I, I don't know specifically what it's going to be, but I know it's going to be awesome, right? Look, look, at, look at verse 3. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that, we can, that, can, that can be seen. Like, who, who here knows how God created everything? Nobody. But we know it's awesome, and he did it. Were you there? I wasn't there. But we know that he did because we have faith that he did it, right? Look at uh, verse 7. It was by faith that Noah built a, an ark to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things, this flood that had never happened before. Like, he has no idea what rain is. He has no idea what a flood is, but yet he believes it. That's just faith. I, I don't know what it's going to look like. I have no idea, but God said it. I believe it. That finishes it. Done. I just believe it. Look at, go on. Look at verse uh, 8. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Where am I going, God? I'm not telling you. Okay. I have a new job for you and a new house for you, the Lord says. Go take it. Where is it? I'm not telling. Just pack up your stuff and leave. I have no, that's faith. I don't know what it's going to be exactly, but I know it's going to be awesome. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can imagine what God has planned for those who love him. It's going to be awesome, except we don't know what it is. That's faith. And so since we don't know what the rewards are, since Jesus didn't list them, could I just offer this conjecture? It's not Bible. This is just me. Can I offer this conjecture, conjecture for your consideration? What if all this giving... All this helping and praying and fasting and all of that. What if all of that is just you being a conduit of God and his provision for that person that you're doing it for? And what if all this charity towards that person was to ultimately get that other person closer to God? To get healed by God, to be helped by God, to be answered by God. And what if the reward that's being waived because you went public and sought out the bottom shelf blessing, what about if the reward that's being waived was that thing that you're actually doing dies right there? Could it be? Very well could be. Maybe if you receive the praise, it goes no further. Maybe the person that you're praying for never receives the help that you asked for because you received the praise for it, and so God didn't engage. I'm not saying that this is the case. I'm saying that rewards are not listed, and so what if that is the reward that you're waving? I don't know. Maybe you settled for a bottom-shelf blessing instead of receiving what God would have in that situation. Maybe your sister has a great need, and, and you're like, listen, I love her, and Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to pray for her, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kill the flesh, and I'm going to increase the spirit, man, and I'm going to fast and pray, and I'm going to fast and pray for, for as long as it takes so I can hear a word of knowledge from you to answer my question, my sister's big question that's on her heart, and she doesn't know what to do, so I'm going to fast and pray for her. Is that good? Should you do that? Absolutely. But if you go public with it, then you might be waving God's answers. And if you, lo if you love others, and you consider, consider others better than yourself, then you will not seek out the blessing that they would say, oh, good job, thanks for fasting, thanks for giving, thanks for helping, you're awesome. And you just keep it on the down low. It's good to have people love you. It's good to have people pray for you. It's good to have people fasting and praying and helping. But it's not as good as God responding. So you have to watch out for your motivation in these things. So listen, if we want to be Christians, 
whose lives are effective in building the kingdom of God, then let's stop settling for bottom shelf blessings, the praise of men. And let's start looking vertically for our abundant rewards. You know, having read this text, you know, over and over and over again over this last week, it kind of grieved my heart thinking that, like, how awful would it be that people are actually, like, engaging in God's work by giving and helping and praying and fasting? Like, people are actually doing this. How awful it would be if, because of the wrong motivation, that you actually dismiss the presence and power of God in the situation that you're actually engaged in. What a, what a waste of time. How horrible would it be? But I think we do it a lot. And I want to be a church that is effective in building the kingdom of God. So God calls us to do good deeds, doesn't he? That's what it says, when you do good deeds. But what good deeds? Does it say? It doesn't. It just says to do good deeds. And God calls us to give. Does he say how much? He just says to give to people. Does God tell us to pray? He says when you pray. You read the scriptures, it will tell you to pray for all people, for all things, and all the time. But listen, get in private. Get in private. Don't show off. Don't get all big and elaborate. Don't babble on and repeat it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Just get in private and get to the point. And God says to fast. But what does he say to fast from there? What does he say for how long? What does he say about how often? He doesn't. He just says do it. He just said just keep it low key. That's all he says. Just keep it low key. These are all godly things. But don't do them to be called godly and holy, right? You do them so that the things that you're doing will actually produce the fruit that God desires in the situation, in the giving, the fruit he desires to, 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 to come to pass in the helping, in the prayer, in the fasting, not only in the other person's life, but in your life as well. And that's where the kingdom of God advances. And that's where ultimate human flourishing occurs. Genuine. Jesus is always changing your outside by changing what's inside of you. And that's what he's going after here. So, I want to give God what he desires so he'll do what he desires to do. Do you guys agree with that? I want to give God what he desires so that he can do the things that he desires to do. So we're going to just change things up here just a little bit tonight as we kind of finish up. Normally, I would just say, hey, let, let's, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And, and I want you to ask God, you know, how much you should give. And, and I want you to either come up and put it in the baskets or the person's going to come through the room with the basket. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just thinking in light of what I read all week, it's like if, if, if he says to give in private, how is that giving in private? If he says to give in private, even if we don't do the pa even if we don't do the come up and put it in, if I'm the if I'm the usher and I'm going like this, and you don't put anything in, don't I mean let's just be honest for a second. Don't you kind of think sometimes people see it and they, they might think you're cheap if you don't give something? I mean, people have all kinds of different thoughts, right? But what are we doing here? We're supposed to be giving it to help. We're not supposed to be doing it to form any opinion from anybody about what anybody's doing. And so that's what happens when this goes like this. And, and listen, if you're an usher and you go like this to you and, 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 and hey, I know how much Matt makes. He does pretty well for himself. What are you, stingy little thing? Or what, what's wrong with you, right? I mean, listen, I mean, can't we just be honest in church? Isn't it the thing? Isn't that we're all broken? This is what we do. I'm not saying that every usher does it every single time, but these are the things that happen, right? So let's just do, let's just do something a little bit different today. Let's turn these lights down. Turn these lights down. Let's turn down the spotlights and let's just do something different. Go to that next thing. I want to just fill the room with some 
some, some, some padding, just some, some music. And I don't want you to be thinking. I want, I want you to get alone. I want you to get alone. 